In this video tutorial, I will be teaching you how I made this wonderful and gorgeous ring out of a simple sterling silver spoon bowl. I started out by flattening the spoon bowl and then running it through the rolling mill with a beautiful texture plate. And I'm using one of our new templates and tracing out my desired design onto the flattened spoon bowl. I'm adding some shank areas to the design and depending on the size of the ring you're going to make those longer or shorter. And uh, I've gone ahead and cut that out with a jeweler saw and using my brass brush to remove the Sharpie marker and filing down those sharp edges right now with a half round ring file. And then just going in and fine tuning and making sure everything is clean and sharp and got really nice edges. It's better and easier to get those edges looking really nice and feeling good while the uh, shank is still flat. So I'm going to bend this by hand rather than on the bender. Not everyone owns a bender. So I have annealed it. Since it went through the rolling mill, it's gotten pretty work hardened. So I've annealed it. And now I have wrapped it around the steel ring mandrel and shaping it. I put it into our ring mandrel cradle and it makes shaping a little bit easier. Helps hold things in place. So I'm taking the shank area and folding that down so they are directly, those two shanks are two are directly across from one another. And get those two lined up. And so you're just going to go back and forth with one shank on top and the other on bottom and then switch that out and that builds tension and allows those pieces to come together very nicely. If things aren't quite perfect and in this case it wasn't. I get them as close together as possible and then cut down through with the jeweler saw and that just removes anything that isn't quite right and keeping those pieces from lining up and matching. And you can see that I got a really nice fit there. You have to have a very good fit or the solder will not flow in that seam. You have to have a gap that has no light through it. And I am using hard solder. This is the first level of soldering. So we're starting out with the solder that melts at the highest temperature. And we'll work our way down from that as we build the ring. Heating the entire ring. When the metal gets red hot, the solder will flow. I'm going to cool it down momentarily on a steel block, put it into the pickle pot, and get it cleaned up. And now it is getting shaped back into its round form on the steel ring mandrel. Make sure you flip it around a couple of times because the ring mandrel is tapered. So you want to make sure you have that flipped around a couple of times while you're shaping it. I'm just cleaning up a little with a brass brush. I've tried it on and I'm finding that the shank in the back is too wide. Those shoulders on either edge are interfering with the ability of my finger to bend. So depending on the size of the ring uh, the length, the uh, width, the thickness of the finger, 
you may want to make some adjustments so you'll be able to bend the finger. This particular design is very wide, both in the front and in the back. So I am taking those shoulder areas down and that is the area that rounds upward from the middle of the shank and doing that both on the bottom and on the top. And I've got a rubber bullet on one of my rotary tools and that is also helping me to remove some of that material and shape that down. It's also really good for helping getting all those edges really nice and smooth. So you can see the shoulders are coming down and that's going to make for a more comfortable fit. So one of the great things about making jewelry is customizing it to exactly what you or your customers need. So I've decided to put a little tiny concho on the back where the seam is and not for any other reason than just to make it decorative. So I need to match the curve of the ring and I've laid it down into one of our ring forming blocks that come with one of our bender kits and shaping that so it fits right on the back of that ring there. Some Mighty Flux to heat up the metal and dry that flux. And I put some medium solder in. We're going to sweat solder that little concho to the back of the ring. Makes a really nice little decorative touch. Focus your heat on the ring itself and not so much on that little concho. The little concho is very delicate and will melt very easily if you apply too much heat. So you want to keep your flame moving and you want to keep your flame mainly away from that concho. You can use your solder pick, push down on the concho just to make sure the solder is flowing between the two. I want that cool down momentarily on the steel bench block, quench and pickle, and we're ready for the next step. Now I'm using a pre-made setting here and this setting can be used for faceted stones and in this case I'm going to be using it with a cabochon. So I need to create a channel in the bottom of this setting that matches the shape of the ring or the curvature of the ring. So I'm rubbing that back and forth on the half round ring file and just keep testing back and forth until I get a curve that matches the curve of the ring. I'm having to widen that out a little bit so I've grabbed a different file that's wider and just keep filing that until you have a fit that has no gap. Um, because as I've said many times before, solder does not fit gaps, so you have to have a really good fit. So you can see here how the fit is really nice, and the bottom of that setting now matches the curve of the ring. So I'm going to use some stainless steel binding wire here, and... This is going to help hold the setting in place during soldering so it doesn't shift on you and you can get it exactly where you want it to be. So we're going to wrap the binding wire through the ring and up over the top, putting the setting in between the wire and the ring shank and twisting that in place. 
nylon pliers didn't work so well, so I grabbed some chain nose pliers to get that nice and tight. But you want that to hold that setting and not allow it to shift. Now I'm feeding the long piece through again, so I'm creating like a crisscross. And same thing, twist it again. And this way it's being held in four different directions. Trim off the excess of your wire there. And then just spend some time getting it lined up exactly where it needs to be. If you need to put marks on your ring shank prior to setting on the setting, to putting the setting on there, which will help you line up, then by all means, go ahead and do that. I've got it set on my fire brick in between a couple of T-pens. Give it some uh, spritz of Mighty Flux. Dry that up. And now we're going to be using some Easy Solder. And I am placing those chips inside the setting. So when the solder flows, it will flow inside the setting towards the outer edges and will effectively join and seal that setting to the ring shank. Just making sure to get all the little chips down up underneath that lip so they are as close to the edges as possible. You want the solder to touch the metal, not just to sit free on the inside. A little more Mighty Flux. And heating the entire ring, going all the way around the ring, up underneath the ring, through the shank, and not focusing the flame on the bezel so much. You can see the solder flowed right there. You can see the solder is flowing very nicely there on the left. A little more of a struggle there on the right. I think I had a tiny little gap there, which is why I'm pressing down on that side of the setting with my soldering pick. So the metal is heat has been heated up and it is a little malleable at this point. So you can press it down against the ring shank and that will allow the solder to flow between the two pieces and seal it in. And I can show you right here in that shot how you can see the solder line and you have a perfect seal there. So clip your wire off. You don't want the wire to go into the pickle because it will contaminate the pickle and turn everything pink. So I'm going to do a little decorative trim. And this is some bead wire from Rio Grande. There was the item number. And I am using some bail making pliers to create a shape on the bead wire, trimming off the excess. And the goal here is to get a really nice snug fit of the bead wire at the base of the, uh, of the stone setting. And it looks like I am gonna remove a few of those beads. And just shape that again, I'm creating an oval shape here for our oval setting. And I need to remove one more bead. And test fitting to see if it, everything looks good. And then it's important to file those cut edges so they match up nicely and solder properly. So bend them down so they are directly 
across from one another. And then go back and forth so you create some tension in the, in the metal. And what I do with items like this is I put the solder down on the soldering surface then lay the piece with the seam over top of the piece of solder. And you're heating from above, so what happens is the solder follows the heat, and the solder will flow right directly up into the seam. The seam actually was very difficult to see at this point, and I didn't have it quite in the right place, so I had to move it over. And you can see how quickly the solder flowed right up into that area. So get it down around the base of the setting and make sure you're matching the curve of the ring. You don't want it just to sit uh, level. You want it to fold down so it matches the curve of the ring. So I'm going to attach this with some easy paste solder. Paste solder is, is a great tool for when you have little delicate items and you only need just a dab and it's hard to get solder in or get it to stay, get little chips to stay in, in tiny places. So filling it in with some paste solder makes for quick, easy work. Paste solder already has flux mixed into it. You do not need to add additional flux. Although at times I have added additional flux. Now you're gonna see here that it looks like the ring setting catches on fire. And what that is, is the flux burning off of the paste solder. So you just want to torch that, let that flux burn off, and then just continue on. So you'll notice I am not heating directly on the setting or on the wire itself, just around it. You can help coax the bead wire down with your solder pick. So it went in, quenched and pickled, brought it back out, and as I usually do between steps, I like to buff everything up with the brass brush just to see where I am and if anything needs adjusting before I move on. I'm going to add a couple of little decorative silver balls. So I've cut two equal lengths of fine silver wire. And the, the fine silver wire is really preferable because it makes perfect little beads with flat bottoms. You wanna melt those on a charcoal block and you get perfect little beads with flat bottoms. Putting a little paste solder on those. Again, a paste solder is great for um, attaching little balls. And heating everything up until you can see the solder has flowed and has attached the balls to the ring. So just put the flame all the way around the ball so the solder goes all the way around between the ball and the ring. So this particular type of setting is a bit of a challenge because of the way it is built. It is very thick. It's a beautiful setting, but it is very thick. And you cannot get the walls folded down over the girdle of the stone unless you thin those walls down a bit. So what I'm using here is a round burr and going around the inside and thinning that upper wall so I'll be able to fold that bezel 
over the girdle of the stone. I'm going to be setting this stone and folding the bezel over with a hand hammer, with a hammer hand piece on a Fordham rotary tool. Uh, again, even though I am thinning down the walls, it is still very difficult to push down by hand a very thick bezel like this. So a hammer hand piece is the tool of, of uh, choice. Now, if you like this type of work and you don't have a hammer, hammer hand piece, uh, you can use a pre-made bezel cup that does not have thick walls and is easy to push over with a prong pusher and then a burnisher. So using the hammer hand piece here, and what it does is it's basically a little hammer and it helps push the metal with the little anvil that's uh, installed on it, it helps push the metal and start to fold that metal down around that girdle edge of this opal. This is a lab created opal. So even though I thinned it down it's still, it is a challenging setting. And this takes time and takes patience. You want to start with north, south, east, and west to get the sides down in those four areas and then go back in and fill all the way around. So you can see now how the top edge has a curve to it. And that is what is holding the stone in place. I did drill a hole in the ring shank, you may have noticed. And that is so if moisture ever got inside underneath that stone, it would be able to be released and not get trapped in there. So once I've got the bezel edges folded down around the girdle, I'm using a blue abrasive wheel. This has got just a slight bit of abrasiveness in it. And I'm going around that top edge and dressing that all up and that helps remove any of the marks from the hammer hand piece. And just have to be really gentle here. If this were uh, something like a CZ or a Sapphire, something that were harder, I wouldn't have to be quite so gentle around that stone. But because this is a lab-created opal, it is softer and it is susceptible to damage. So you really have to keep that abrasive wheel on the metal itself without slipping over onto the opal. And once I've gotten all those tool marks out, I put a red polishing, um, it's a rubber, a rubber wheel. This has no abrasiveness to it and is just for polishing. And you can see how that is shining up the top edge of that bezel really nicely. Again, really having to stay away from that stone so as not to damage it. And just go slow. Take your time. And making sure I have all the debris and dirt and dust and any sort of polishing uh, preparations off of there. And it turned out to be absolutely gorgeous. And 
And then I went back in with the brass wheel on my rotary and just went in to do some touch-ups. I really like the finish that the brass has on sterling. Now, if you were going to put this into a tumbler or you were going to do any buffing on your bench buffer, that would all need to be done before you set your stone. And there you have it. And you can see how beautifully that bezel top edge of that bezel folds over that opal and holds that opal in place. If you have any questions, be sure to post them and I will do my very best to answer them.